Gerald, you need to play the video. You're back on your slides. Okay, we're on the video. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this, the first webinar um, of July Savings Month. And my name is Gerald Mwandiambira, and I'm the CEO of the South African Savings Institute. And today's webinar is really a webinar which is aimed at the youth. It's aimed at those who are young in heart and those who are planning their futures and would like to know more about money. Before we get started, I'll just give you a bit of a background about who SASI is or the South African Savings Institute. The South African Savings Institute is a non-profit organization which was founded in 2001. And at that time, it was founded with the intention of driving a savings culture or improving the savings rate for South Africa. It was proven at that time that countries which save better rely less on foreign investment and can drive their own local economies. 
So for the last 20 years, the South African Savings Institute has indeed been driving a savings culture in South Africa with three primary pillars. The first pillar which we do have at SASI is that of advocacy. And by being advocates, it means we represent consumers, business and government and get them all around one table to try and find better ways for South Africa to save or improve on its savings behavior. And indeed, SASI is part of NEDLAC and also was involved in the, the, the thought process and the process in which the tax-free savings accounts came into being. So pillar number one is advocacy. Our second pillar is that of consumer education. And this is part of our consumer education, July Savings Month. We started July Savings Month in 2008. And in 2008, um, no one knew what July Savings Month was, but now pretty much everyone knows July is Savings Month. So we drive that conversation around financial literacy, consumer education. And the last pillar of SASI is that of research. Um, we've in the past held symposiums and think tanks where we've had the best academics in the country sit down and discuss savings in South Africa. So I'd like to welcome everyone who signed on this afternoon to this particular webinar. If you have any questions through the, through the, pro, through the program, I would encourage you to just simply jot down your questions on the message panel. We'll try and pick them up as we go along and hopefully address your questions in terms of anything that you would like to know and learn. One of the things about being young is that at least in my case, we were not taught about money. A lot of the conversations we had were not financial. And indeed, we ran a Twitter poll um, on the SASI Twitter, and the poll was clear. Many youths want to know about saving. They want to know about budgeting. They want to know about compound interest because the question was simply put out there, what things do you wish you had learned when you were young? And most people are saying they want to know about bank accounts, home loans, the right decisions before it's too late. So as a student, if you are a student and signed on, you may be living on a super tight budget and you may be getting your first taste of credit and getting yourself into a cycle of debt. Hopefully this webinar will help you to find ways to get out of debt and maybe also make better financial decisions. Now to this afternoon, we're going to cover a number of topics like student budgeting, saving, extra income for students, as well as student banking solutions. Now, without further ado, we have two guests lined up for this afternoon. Our first guest, we're still waiting for him to come on board, um, Mr. Kakisho Mamabolo. He's the spokesperson for the National Student Financial Aid Scheme, commonly known as NASFAS. And Kakisho has varied in career, and it's taken him from newsrooms and right through to the Ministry of Finance and, Finance and Parliament. And he then served under the Chief of Staff in the DHEX, which is the Department of Higher Education. And he serves as the Director of the T Institute of South Africa and is an alumni uh, and convocation executive for his al alma mater, which is the University of Limpopo. Kahisho manages corporate services in the office of the CEO at NASFAS and serves as the organization's official spokesperson. So he'll be joining us and also giving us his wise words of wisdom. As we know, NASFAS is the principal funder for many, many students in South Africa, and they have a view around how students should conduct their finances. However, our first speaker for the afternoon is Mr. Chris Phillip, who's the youth product manager at APSA, who are our partner for July Saving Month for the last four years. And Chris Phillip is currently responsible for the development and management of product propositions within the transactional business at APSA. Chris brings along a blend of marketing, product management and finance experience and knowledge. He completed his BCO Honors degree in marketing and has a certificate in financial markets and instruments cum laude and is, has a BCom in finance and is currently level two stand candidates studying for the CFA program, Chartered Financial Analyst. His career started in advertising and later he works for FMCG companies in marketing and product management before entering the financial services industry. 
Chris was head of strategic marketing at Stir Clinical Distribution, head of marketing at Postbank, and head of product management at Postbank before his current role in the APSA transactional space. Chris has launched a number of products in his career, including youth products and services, as well as individual uh, products in the group savings portfolio. So I'd like to welcome Chris to the webinar and hand over the floor to him. I just want to remember, remind everyone that you are all welcome to ask questions. Being young means that you can have a voice. Let's have those voices. We can see your questions, communicate with us. And those who are participating both on Facebook and on Zoom might just win some lovely cash prizes by the end of this particular webinar. Over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, uh, Gerald. Uh, and uh, hello to everyone out there who is watching. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm not going to waste any time. I'm just going to get into it. So Gerald mentioned a whole lot of things that uh, uh, the youth might be interested in knowing. I hope today I'm going to touch on a lot of them and where I don't cover many uh, things that you still wish uh, you could hear about. Just put them in, 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 the, in, in the question section. And at the end, if we have time, we will be able to cover each and every one of those. So I wanted to start uh, my uh, conversation today with a bit of a, a fun fact, uh, a, a teaser, if you like. Uh, the theme for this month is about savings in your own language. And uh, I've done some work to try and understand if indeed this idea does in fact in reality apply. And I've found really interesting information on it. So uh, way back in the 1930s, we had a professor who was also interested in the very same question. And he did some research to try and find out if indeed language does have a bearing on the way we behave. And uh, he did come up with the results that confirmed that uh, it does in, in fact uh, influence the way we uh, think and our disposition towards uh, uh, certain things. To give you a simple example, he uh, tested uh, uh, communities where, for example, uh, colors were not as clearly defined as we know them. For instance, in certain communities, um, you, green and blue are seen as the same color. And as a result, uh, if you ask people from those communities uh, if they can see a difference between a color green and a color blue, they have battle seeing that color because inherently in the way they talk about it, it then sort of like uh, um, changes their perspective in the way they see the color. Another example was done uh, in Australia um, amongst the, the uh, Aboriginal uh, communities. And there, uh, in those communities, they don't have the words left and right. And uh, the way they would uh, define left and right is based on the way we look at map. So they, they refer to north and south, east and west. And uh, for them, it requires quite an intense uh, uh, ability to tune in and uh, to be fully oriented in where you are and where you are facing. And uh, these guys can tell you at any time, if you ask the person, um, where is Chris standing, for instance, the person will say, uh, northeast of me, something like that. Something that in our own communities, we can't define. Again, that was defined by the way they speak. Uh, but I think the more prevalent example or the more relevant example to us is uh, another study that was done by another professor at Yale. And uh, this professor wanted to take this uh, discovery forward. So he looked specifically at savings. And uh, in savings, he basically looked at two types of languages. Languages that look at, um, they call them future-oriented languages, languages like English, where we have emphasis on words like shall and will, etc. And then he also looked at other languages. One of those languages is Finnish, which is the language they speak in Finland. And there, the, 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 the language is used somewhat differently to the way uh, we look at it. And those languages are, are, are futureless languages. That's what they are referred to. And there, they, they, they basically, if they say, I am going to work tomorrow, they will say, um, I go to work tomorrow. Uh, and if they're going to work today, they say, I go to work today. So there's less emphasis on the future. And the words like will and shall are not really playing a role. 
So he then uh, looked at a number of respondents and then he came back uh, to look at the outcomes. The people with the language that placed less emphasis on the future, i.e. Finnish languages or featureless languages, if you like, had a sense of agency. In other words, they tended to save more. They had more retirement assets uh, 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 at the end. And there were many other spin-offs, including the GDP of the country, which is influenced by savings. Um, and so today, as I start, I want uh, everyone to start uh, reflecting on their own uh, disposition. Are you the kind of person who likes to procrastinate, for example, or are you the kind of person, once you think of something, you wanna get down and get to do it? I want to encourage you that your disposition or your inclination should be about how do I get uh, to do the stuff that I want to do immediately without any procrastination. So those were my brief opening uh, remarks. So today I want to talk about savings. Uh, I want to get straight to the core of the topic. But in talking about savings, I want to talk about the things also around savings. One of those being budgeting and some of the budgeting ways uh, and tips. And I also then want to get into saving and what are the stumbling blocks in savings and how can we get around those uh, 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 savings, uh, savings uh, stumbling blocks. So I'm going to assume that we are we, we don't have a universal way of budgeting. So I'm going to start by defining what we mean by budgeting. So budgeting is basically a way of acknowledging how much money you are receiving, writing it down. And, and when I say money you are receiving, I deliberately did not use the word salary because very often people uh, tend to think that savings and budgeting is for people who are earning an income, a formal income. But there is always some form of income that everyone gets, particularly for the youth, um, there is income that comes from the parents, you might be doing part-time jobs, or there might be some other way in which you are receiving income, you might even be receiving a social grant, that is income, and you need to be writing it down. Once you have uh, acknowledged your income, you then need to acknowledge your expenses, and again, there's a way in which you look at your expenses. Expenses can be limitless if you do not uh, put a limit to what you want to spend on and what you don't want to spend on. And that is one of the things that a budget can help you put together. Now, before we even get into how we budget uh, from, the, uh, from the bottom up, let's talk about how savings fit into budgeting. Savings is only one part of the things that should feature in your budget. And therefore, uh, when you are budgeting, you should not say whatever is left at the end is my savings. No, savings, and I mean deliberate savings, is something that should be planned for. There are certain disciplines around it. And uh, therefore, one of the things that uh, say you should do when you are planning to save is to first define why you are saving, what are your, what are your savings goals. You may have a goal that... Um, tomorrow you need to go buy something relatively low cost at the mall. Uh, on the other hand, you could uh, be budgeting that maybe next year you want to buy yourself a car. All of those things, you need to jot them down. And we will talk about how they then feature into the budget, but all of those things need to be listed. So it, uh, just to recap, it is important to have objectives, savings objectives. It is important to budget. And in budgeting, it is important to recognize all your income streams and once you have your, all your income streams, we'll then talk about how you can then scale down your expenses so that they fit into your budget. So um, if I can then uh, uh, talk about uh, the different ways of budgeting. So budgeting should be defined by the cycle upon which you receive your income. Um, other, most people generally get their salaries or their income monthly, but not everyone. There are people who get paid as and when they go to work. There are people who get paid on a weekly basis, and there are people who get paid on a fortnightly basis. Your budget needs to respect that cycle uh, because you don't want to have a, a, a cycle, a budgeting cycle that is completely out of sync with how your money is flowing into your account if you have an account. And we'll talk about accounts uh, just now. So. If you are receiving your money on a weekly basis, you need to budget on, on a weekly basis. We call that a micro budget. It's a small budget that is not supposed to be elaborate. 
it is uh, very focused on specific things that need to be spent within the week. And in there, there should still be some component of saving, which you can then roll up, uh, say, four times a month into a monthly savings amount. That is very important. So if you're getting money on a fortnightly basis, same, same, same uh, argument applies. And then now let's get into uh, how to put together a budget for the first time. Uh, as I said, I think I alluded to the first part that you have your income, you've listed it, and you know exactly how much you earn per cycle, whatever that cycle is. Um, now let's get into the expenses. In the expenses, I have uh, uh, basically broken it down into what I call the five Fs of budgeting. And in those five Fs, there are deliberate uh, uh, categories. The first category is about financing or your financing obligations. In other words, if you have one of those people uh, that has already got some kind of uh, uh, credit agreement uh, that you need to honor on a repeated basis, those are the things that you need to list first. So if you have, uh, uh, let's say a study loan, uh, if you may have a, a car loan, if you are at that stage, whatever loan you may have, it needs that payment that you need to make per month needs to be listed there. It is very important because as a youth, you don't want uh, to start thinking about loans last and you end up in a situation where you miss payments because that will affect your credit profile. In other words, your ability to borrow. Um, once you've messed up your credit profile, you might miss out on other things that are worth borrowing for. And I'm going to talk about what are the things that are worth borrowing for. Um, so it is important, therefore, that all your partners, in other words, uh, the people that you've borrowed from, you respect them and you prioritize them in the way you budget. List all of those things. The second category uh, basically refers to uh, fixed expenses. This category is exactly the same as the previous ex uh, category, except that in this category, you don't have contractual obligations. Um, so for example, uh, food. Food fix, fits into this fixed category uh, group and you can't do without it. You can't say, no, I'm going to save, starve myself to save. So you need to cater for that because that is your basic need. Um, if you have rental, include rental in there. So all your basic things that you need to keep go that you need to keep yourself going throughout your budget cycle will then fall into that fixed expenses category. The third piece then is the piece that we are talking about today. Then the third part is about uh, the future. Again, I talked about objectives at the beginning of uh, uh, my, my, my speech and there you would have listed that I want to uh, uh, buy my mother a couch, I want to buy a car, I want uh, to be able to afford university next year, whatever those things are. Those things then fall into that and you don't put the lump sum amount in there. You first have to uh, understand how far this objective is into the future. So if you have uh, um, decided that you're gonna buy your mother a couch in December, you then have to count how many months you have to go to December. If you divide uh, the amount that is required for the couch into the number of months that are left, how much money do you need to pay? If that amount turns out to be much higher than what you can tolerate, it means that um, you need to stretch out your, your savings goal maybe into March next year, et cetera, et cetera. Because the one thing you, want, you don't want to do when you are budgeting is to lie to yourself. In other words, setting uh, unrealistic objectives. So it is important then that you get to that point where everything is built into the budget properly and it's realistic. So that's where you put your savings. And again, I emphasize in savings, you can have short-term, medium-term and long-term objectives. But uh, uh, budgeting basically helps you to uh, uh, spread that across uh, the timeframes that are relevant for that particular goal. Then the third part is fun, uh, which is your fourth F. Fun is basically about throughout the month, uh, we know that uh, uh, the youth, uh, particularly the students have got very ever changing uh, lifestyles and might need at some point to go out and meet friends uh, and maybe you need to buy a, a takeaway through the month, or you need to go and watch a movie. 
you need to budget for those things. Again, a, a lot of people uh, like to think of those things as wasteful and I'm not gonna budget for it. But if you really know that you can't resist, there is no point in telling yourself that you're not going to do it because eventually you're going to do it and then you're going to spend money that you were not supposed to spend, money that was supposed to go to something else. So again, that is very important. The last uh, piece is basically, I called it a uh, fumble. Um, so throughout the month, uh, there are things that uh, you either may have not planned for or things, life happens. Uh, uh, um, you, you have a car and your tire bursts, or if you are uh, 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 renting somewhere, something happens inside the household and you need to pay or replace it. So these are what I, what I would call, in other words, emergencies. And you can plan for emergencies, but the reality is that you don't know when an emergency will come and how much it will be. So you like to have some buffer. Uh, another way of dealing with the fumble category is to just include it uh, in the savings category, but clearly articulate it as this is simply for emergencies. And if the emergencies don't come, great, then you saved. Um, so that's basically it uh, in terms of how you should view your budget. Um, in terms of what should a budget look like? Um, there are many tools online that provide uh, budget uh, uh, samples. Um, Microsoft uh, Excel has got uh, budget templates. You can look there. What I would advise is look for something fairly simple, something you can understand. Some of these templates are very complicated and they might detract you from what you're trying to do. So look for something very simple. If I uh, just picture what uh, I would be looking for is something that just lists things. There's uh, months and on the side, on the, on, on the rows, I just list my incomes and my expenses according to the categories. And that would be uh, just as sufficient as something much more fancy. The fancy ones are also useful, but those are for more advanced people, people who have been doing budgeting for some time and they understand exactly the different ways you can slice your budget. And again, I'm not saying don't use those, but first make sure that you understand the basics. Now, uh, in terms of tips, uh, savings tips. So I don't think uh, most of us are born with this inclination that uh, I want to save immediately. The first thing you want to do when you get your income is to spend it. Uh, but uh, you then need to start understanding your own behavior and how you are spending money. And I've listed a few things, and this, are, this is not an exhaustive list, but I've given you 10 tips. The first one is to be conscious um, about uh, savings. So, uh, and, and what are the certain things that may trigger an undesirable behavior? A good example is, if you know that you are the kind of person that uh, likes, I'm, I'm using a stupid example, but if you know that you are someone who likes to buy pies, um, don't go to a, a, a grocery store or a retailer and walk next to the pie station and uh, uh, in, a, in an empty stomach. Eat first, and then after you've uh, had enough in your, in your tummy, go to the shops and do what you need. You are more likely to resist if you do something like that. The second part is about uh, uh, the difference between home cooked versus takeaways. You can't live on takeaways every day. In any setup, DIY is always the best. So try to do things inside where you live and be as uh, stingy as you can, not, not excessively, but try and be stingy with your money. Don't spend it when you don't need to spend it. The third one is about the difference uh, uh, well, not the difference, but boredom and binging. And sometimes I also find myself doing this. Sometimes you're sitting at home, you have nothing to do, and you end up going to the fridge. You open the fridge and you just stay into the fridge. You should be careful about such behaviors because not only is it about wasting the food, but while you are standing there opening the fridge door, you are running an electricity bill. Um, so, and, and, and if someone asks you, uh, what are you looking for? Very often, uh, you won't know what you're looking for. You're just hovering. So again, that's trick number three. Um, number four is being able to pay things on time. If you have commitments, pay them on time. One of the ways in which you can waste money without understanding you're wasting money is to spend it on reconnection fees. I'm going to use, for example, uh, let's say you have a decoder that you're supposed to pay every month. 
this month you realize that no, uh, uh, my finances are not good, so I'm not going to uh, pay it right away. And then uh, they switch it off. And 10 days later, you realize I can't live without it. And you do this uh, 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 on a cyclical basis. So every month you keep doing this. There's always a charge that comes with that reconnection. Sometimes it's uh, 50 rands, it can go up to 80 rands, et cetera, et cetera. It's a waste of money. Uh, so if you've decided I can tolerate and uh, doing without something, then stick to it. Otherwise, don't kid yourself. Just pay the bill on time and, uh, and avoid the reconnection fee. And uh, uh, number five is uh, a student, as students, uh, we like to show one another that, uh, you know, me, I'm made, I've got things. And no, don't be that person. Try and be as thrift and subtle as possible. And one of the ways in which you can save money is go and share an apartment with someone, but don't go and rent out an apartment with two bedrooms and you're going to stay in one bedroom, the other one is going to stay um, empty and you're not going to use it. So everything, every buck you spend has to be for a purpose. Um, and then I, I know this one, I'm probably gonna touch a nail for some people. Other poor behaviors are things like smoking cigarettes. Uh, I don't know what cigarette packs are these days, but I'm sure it's around 50 rands. And uh, ask yourself, do I really need to, if I'm on a stressed budget? If you have money to throw around and you don't need to worry much about uh, what we're talking about today, great. But if you're really serious about saving, saving is everywhere around you and there's always something you, you can improve. So I'm not uh, targeting cigarettes per se, but I'm saying there are certain things that you are consuming today that uh, perhaps you need to reflect on. Then uh, moving closer to financial services, uh, trick number seven is about banking products. Banking products sometimes are different in the way they are priced. You need to understand what you are paying for, how much you are paying. So for instance, other products have monthly fees, others don't. Ask yourself, what's the difference? Then you get products that uh, have uh, value added services that come with them. I'm proud to say that uh, in this uh, uh, part, at APSA, we have exactly the products that you need where you have products that don't have monthly fees. And you can do your banking pretty much for free. And we still give you value added services. Uh, things like uh, free takeaway, vouchers, discounts on various things that are relevant for you. So that is also important in how you choose a bank account. Um, and number eight is about uh, uh, savings, the interest. So there is one thing, saving, which is about storing money and making sure that you don't store it under uh, a mattress or where someone can find and uh, uh, take it. Uh, savings about safety of money, but over and above that, check the interest that you are earning. And again, we have these products and we're gonna be talking extensively about savings uh, products on the 14th of July. So look out for that conversation. The, the second last one is about uh, loans. Don't borrow money that you don't need. Don't borrow money to go buy a pair of shoes. Uh, don't go borrow money to because you want to, to see that uh, you can also afford that nice brand that your friends are wearing. We have different backgrounds. So borrow money when you need it for things like education. Uh, quite frankly, as a student, I would impress upon you that the only loan you probably need is a loan that takes you further. A, a, a loan that is helping you to become an asset. Uh, so educational loans, the loans that you get from NESFAS or any of the loans that you get from the banks, but those loans need to be for education, not for uh, 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 discretionary consumption. Then lastly, uh, ask yourself um, what you need uh, uh, in the future. So uh, today you could be borrowing uh, to buy a car and you borrow 100% of the price of the car. Ask yourself, do you really need the car now? Or can you spend a few months saving uh, and then it relieves the pressure on you, let's say after two years, when you can put in a down deposit of say 50%, 20%, et cetera, uh, something like that. So those are my top 10 uh, uh, tips and tricks on how to save. And I think I've uh, talked about some of the products that you can look out for within the banking space that are good enough uh, or are responsible enough from transactional accounts, savings accounts, borrowing, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, so that was my uh, bit uh, of contribution in today's webinar. Thanks everyone for giving me your ears. Back to you, Joe. Thanks a lot, Chris. And you did cover quite a bit. And we've got a question here from Tuso Tabana. Um, he's asking specifically, does APSA have a separate savings account for students? I think you said you do have transactional products. So yes, I think I'll answer for you. If you go to any APSA branch, you will get a student account. But he asks specifically for those who are funded by NASPAS. I don't know, I don't know if um, you have any specific account for NASPA students or with facilities which cater for NASPA students. Chris? Um, so we don't uh, uh, dedicate anything specifically to people uh, who have been assisted by NASPAS, but yes, we do have uh, savings products that can be used by everyone else. And you will add interest there, and uh, it does everything you need to get going from a savings point of view. Okay, I'm just going to check if our if Kakisho is ready. I'm going to change the program a little bit. Um, Kakisho has a bit of an urgent personal matter to attend to. Um, if you're available, Kakisho, just come on screen. And I'll just answer one question whilst we wait and get a response from Kakisho. Um, Somebody, I got a question here, Sassi, we're only hearing about Sassi now. You say it's been around for 20 years. Where have you been? Where have you been hiding? And do you cater for students and youth as a whole? Um, and you're, in answer to your question, this is coming from Kabira Pempeta. Kabira Pempeta, excuse me if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, and we've also got a question from Joseph Sakoneka. Now, um, Kabira Sasi indeed has been around for 20 years and we have catered a, a, done a lot of student initiatives um, in the past. However, <coughs> because um, of the fees must fall challenges and getting on campuses for the last three, four years, we haven't been that visible, but we will definitely be more active in the student space. Um, hence why we're specifically having this particular webinar because we know the power of the youth in terms of understanding money. One of the things you might have heard of, they we used to have a program called T Teach Children to Save. It's now been rebranded um, Star Savers. It's for young children. It's the one which is for primary school children. And we want to fill that gap. And that's specifically why we have invited um, a partnership or started to get a relationship with NASFAS who are a big uh, player in the student space. And I'm going to invite Kahisha, I'll reintroduce him again. Um, he's uh, come from a journalistic type of environment from the newsrooms of SABC to working in government communications in the Ministry of Finance and Parliament. He's served as the Chief of Staff at the Deputy Minister of Higher Education and Training. And he serves as the Director of the T Institute of South Africa and an alumni and convocation executive for his alma mater, which is the University of Limpopo. Kahisho manages corporate services in the office of the CEO for the National Student Financial Aid Scheme and serves as the organization's spokesperson. So he's going to address us and let's get some rules. I know when you say NASFA students get excited. He's not here to answer queries around your application. He is not here to answer um, any dissatisfaction or challenges you are facing as a NASFA funded student, there are official channels for that. The reason we've got Kakisho here is because Kakisho and the new CEO Andile have taken it um, as their personal um, responsibility to try and drive financial literacy for students and also to try and get better financial behavior in terms of funded students. And I think his ideas are going to give us direction in terms of where NASFAS um, is taking us. I've been on the My NASFAS wallet and the new website, and it's got exciting stuff there. You can track your spending. You can basically, as a student, start getting some of those skills we are discussing now around budgeting and getting better skilled in terms of your money. Kakisho, I hand over the floor to you, and please um, lead, the, lead the conversation. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, um, uh, Gerald. I'm not sure if I am uh, audible enough. Can you hear me clearly? Um, very clear, loud and clear. 
Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the broad uh, introduction. I got to learn a little bit about myself today. <laughs> and of course, uh, good afternoon to the um, audience. Yes, indeed, as the National Student Financial Aid Scheme, we are appreciative of the opportunity that has been given to us to participate on July, the saving month. And as a scheme of government, we would like to share a few things uh, that uh, may be important to, to you, especially the students, but also we see this platform as important to reach out to those who may have children uh, that are studying at, at university or TVET colleges. So the National Student Financial Aid Scheme, it's actually a scheme of government. It's, a, it's an entity established by an act of parliament. So we report to the Minister of Higher Education and Training, Dr. Blade Nzmande. We are largely funded uh, by government. So the money that we, we use to fund this come from the taxpayers. And this year we are celebrating our 30 year anniversary since we were established we were initially established as what we know, we are known as um, Gahiso Trust. And then we then became uh, what was known by TEFSA. And then ultimately now we are called the National Student Financial Aid Scheme. And over these years, we have funded over um, uh, 4 million students in South Africa. And we are largely funding students that are going to 26 universities and 30 TVET colleges. And as in 2017, government announced fee-free education or what is commonly referred to subsidized higher education and training uh, funding for, for, for the poor. What does this mean? This it meant that from 2018 onwards, NESFAS was funding students that will get full cost of study, full bursaries. And uh, before 2018, students would get a loan, which is converted to a bursary based on students' performance. Meaning if a student uh, reached the progression requirement, a certain portion of that loan, which is 40% each year, Will be converted into a bursary and this was done for the first year second year and final year was 100 percent bursary but now nesfas does not talk loans anymore we talk 100 percent bursary it comes with a lot of benefits uh, benefits for students and that's why it's important to explain uh, what we do uh, during this uh, saving months because it has a huge impact on students' um, uh, life. So from 2018, NESFAS is giving students a lot of benefits. One of the benefits is that a student with a, 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 an allowance. This is your allowance that is categorized in individual uh, pockets. The first pocket of the allowance goes to uh, study material. And a student will get a certain amount reinforced for study material. A student can go to a, 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 a secondhand bookstock bookstore of their choice or go to a normal uh, bookstore where they can buy brand new books. Or they can use money and buy a laptop or buy any other assistive devices with that allowance for study material. We do the same for students with disabilities. Students with disabilities, we also give like a specific computers or, or tape recorders, anything that assist a student uh, to study. Since NES, uh, uh, the country has gone into lockdown, we have introduced laptops. So all the students that are funded by NESFAS are not receiving laptops. If you have received a laptop at a university, you will not get a laptop directly from NESFAS. 
But if you have received, you have not received it from your university, you can uh, uh, apply and or, or not apply, you can order for your laptop online. We also have grocery. We give students money every month to buy groceries. And this is very, very important because what we have seen with the money we give for groceries, we find that our students um, celebrate when the money comes in. In fact, there's a hashtag on Twitter, uh, Gerald and, and the colleagues, you must check it. It's called hashtag Ingenile, meaning money is in. And, and the hashtag Ingenile gain popularity when NESFA students uh, get paid. Um, they immediately uh, get into their uh, social media and then celebrate that Imalia Nesfas in Genile. But there is a need for us to educate our students on how to plan. And I'm glad that uh, APSA is here to explain how students should, 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 uh, should spend their money. And I don't, I don't have to go through that process to say, this is how the student must, must, must spend their money. But I think the important thing here is, when a student gets, when you get a, your, money as a student you need to save it you need to to save it and plan on how much you are going to use why because nesfa's allowance does not get into your bank account or paid into your portal at a, at a specific date we are still working on a date which all the students will get money on a specific date so it's very very important that when that money comes in you plan accordingly and you use it accordingly. Another allowance we give is accommodation. We, 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 we give money for your accommodation uh, if you are off campus. That money goes into account. Um, if a student is from their own pocket, but if the accommodation is private, but it's, 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 it's regulated, by the institution, we will then pay that money to the institution and the institution will pay money for accommodation to the student. There are instances where this money for food and for allowances is either back paid or is paid in tranches. So it's very important. So a student can get close to uh, 70,000 for the money that they need to spend for the year. That's a lot of money. Therefore, it's very, very important that we should educate our students on how to spend and how to save. Because if you are doing metric, you go to university the following year and NESFAS gives you 20,000. I mean, what do you do with it? Most of our students, they do send some money home because we are funding students that are the first ones to go to university in most cases at home, or they are the first uh, 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 to put money, I mean, bread on the table. Another allowance we give to our students is um, a, a personal comfort allowance. I'll, 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 I'll say personal comfort. This is toilet for, for the people. Also toilet. The ladies, uh, the gents as well, we give everybody. So 275 a month, because we know our students in addition to their grocery amount. We also give money for transport for those that are not staying on uh, their own accommodation. Um, like myself, I, 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 I stay near the university at home. So there's no need to stay on campus. So we will, in that in case, give you money for the transport uh, to, to, to go to varsity or to, 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 to the college. So if, if all these allowances I'm giving to you today, you, you add all of them, in a month, a student will get a lot of money. And this money end up going somewhere else if a student does not know how to, 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 to save. So we are encouraging all our NESFAS funded students to, to save and to plan their finances. We also pay for tuition. Luckily, the tuition we pay, we don't pay it into the student spend account, but rather we, we pay the tuition into the university account. But we have now revised our agreement with the university that they need to credit a student's account within seven days. 
of getting their tuition or seven days of getting their allowances. Because if they don't do that, students go hungry and they, so I can confirm that up to now, up to June, NESFAS has paid allowances to all the students. We have also paid allowances, I mean, tuition to all the students. And these are the students that the universities and the colleges have informed us that they are now registered with the university and they've given us the correct details. There are students, we have about 50,000 students that we have, we are not going to fund this year because they did not meet their, their, their requirements. We do have about 10,000 students who are qualifying for NESPAS, but we cannot give them allowances and other benefits because they are, uh, 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 their institutions have not, not confirmed the modules that they have they have registered and they have not confirmed whether the student is stay on campus or off campus, which is very, very crucial for us to generate their agreement for the students. One the other thing that is important that we do as an institution, we also pay registration for, for our students. So when you get funded by NESFAS, you are not supposed to pay registration. That money is claimed by your institution. So in a case where a student has already paid registration, they, we, have, we have requested the institution to re, re, reinvest those students. So in a nutshell, that's what we do as the National Student Financial Aid Scheme. So for 2022, we have received over 800,000 applications for 20, I mean, for 2021. And um, these are the first entering students. So when we add students that are retaining, meaning they are continuing with their second year or senior studies under NESFAS, we can confirm that we will be funding well above 1.2 million students this year only for 2021. And these are the students that are getting 100% bus that qualifies to receive the benefit I have shared with you. And government is, is spending close to 41.5 billion for all the students for 2021. And we must appreciate that, yes, the Department of Treasury, National Treasury, has gone back to look for additional funds following the budget speech and have come up with a, a system that will in, ensure that all qualifying students are funded without any, any uh, uh, problem. But what we want to say today is that for all the students that are funded by NESFAS, you need to know two important things. You need to know that you do qualify for a laptop if you don't have, and laptops are available. You go online, you order, you put your address, a laptop is delivered on your campus. Secondly, we have institutions that are using their own payment system. In this case, a student, a university or a college may use APSA Bank. So it's advisable that you can open an APSA Bank account or whichever bank account that the institution is using, you do that on your own so that the university pays that money into the bank account. But if the university is participating on a NESFAS payment system, it means you are using what we call NESFAS wallet. The NESFAS wallet, it's a cell phone banking solution that is owned and is controlled by NESFAS, meaning we will pay all the allowance money into your wallet, we will pay your 275 of the uh, sanitary towels for yourself, you'll also get the accommodation money into that if we get a lease and we know that you are staying, you are staying in an accredited accommodation. And for you to enroll on the NESFAS wallet, you can go on our website, register. You can use a hashtag. There is a special page which is dedicated on how to use the NESFAST was important and seen a lot with the NESFAST wallet is that the elements of, of fraud and syndicates, people are out there looking for NESFAST students just to either steal their cell phones or steal their PIN numbers so they can get on the NESFAST wallet. We are indebted with calls 
where students are calling are saying my next past wallet has been blocked when we do our investigation we find that someone was trying to access their next first wallet and therefore we encourage our students to keep their pin numbers for next first wallet very safe next first wallet you can withdraw cash anywhere you can redeem the voucher if you want to but the important thing is that you get cash and you can use it the way you want to with all that i would like to end here but also to say that we are looking forward to opening applications for 2022 which is likely going to be in august and all our applications happen online in a case where you are in a rural area we will come to you through the nyda office or our outreach and then what is also important is that through the nesfas website you can apply on on your cell phone it takes as little as five minutes and all those that are studying i mean are receiving social support uh, or security support which is sasa they automatically qualifies for nesfas thank you thank you kakisho quick one before we let you go there's a few questions for you first question yes i can stay for some questions here okay there's a few questions for you here um it says um a question from Tuso is mm. regarding the laptops he says can i keep my laptop after i finish my studies or do i have to return it you keep your laptop when you finish your studies so we pay we give a laptop uh, for your first year of uh, application for the laptop okay and Queen i think we will still give you money books. Yeah. Okay, so too so sorry about that. Um, we will you can keep your laptop. First year you get your laptop, you have to look after it until you finish your studies, but it's yours. Um, I think we're getting a lot of questions in terms of students actually saying they want more financial literacy. And I think this is the reason why Ukakisho was here, is basically to start to say, look, NASFAS knows that they're distributing 70,000 Rand to a 17 or 18 year old is a lot of money. Many people don't earn 70,000 Rand who have been working many years. And it's a challenge. You need to be taught how to budget. So financial literacy is definitely going to be hand in hand with your responsibility over these finances. Kabira is asking, does NASFAS have any measures in place to curb reckless or inappropriate spending by students? So if you can see that they are being, you know, in Genile every time, is there a way of, of curbing that? No, no, no. We absolutely have no control over how students are spending. However, we do put a limit in terms of um, where uh, 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 the, the, the student can spend in terms of the books. We had a voucher which restricts you, like if you were doing a uh, law, uh, a voucher will not have allowed you to pay for the um, marketing books because it's not within your area. But we find that students don't like those vouchers, so we give them cash. But indeed, we don't restrict them on how, how they they should spend they some may as well do spend it recklessly yeah so basically as a student nasfas is saying we're treating you like adults and we expect you to be responsible for your own finances which you carry through your entire life now we've got liven len Corsi, who's asking when does one apply for nasfas when applying for university or only when you've been accepted you apply for nasfas every year from August, and the closing date ends in September, but it's not linked with admission at university. You can apply for NESFAS without being admitted at university. In fact, we encourage everyone to apply for NESFAS even though they have not applied at university. However, for NESFAS money to roll out, we confirm with all the universities with using your ID number if you've got acceptance. You may not know that you have acceptance, but as NESFAS, we, we will know. And if we know, we will tell you that you, you have been accepted at VETS, you can go then register for free. So our money follows the student. Okay, now 
does NASFAS have a limit into how many people in one household can qualify for funding? That's the first question. I'll give you three at one go because there's a hell of a lot of there's a lot of NASFAS questions coming through. The second question which has come through is um, someone who's asking, they, they obviously have accommodation which they want to register with NASFAS. They want to know how do I get um, my, my, my accommodation registered um, with uh, NASFAS. Yeah. We've got uh, one more question. It's saying, um, when you apply for a laptop, do you still receive the book allowance? So is it one or the other, or it's about you knowing how to budget your laptop and your books? Okay, I'll start with the last one. When you are a university student, you will get uh, allowances. You use it to buy a laptop. Uh, and then the rest of the money, you can keep it. Our laptops are very affordable. I think they are as little as 6,000. They were made specifically for the, our students. However, your following year, you will get an allowance again for books. So you can still use it for, for, for books. But the Tibet college students, don't get any allowance for study material because they get studies material for free. So they get their laptops for free. And I'll go to the second question about uh, accommodation. You can register as a pro landlord or a provider for private accommodation. However, you must be credited by the institution where you want to provide your services. We don't restrict where students must stay. We don't give letters of support for private accommodation providers because we see private accommodation providers as an extension of accommodation for the institutions. So that is managed by the institution. But once you are accredited, we will pay you through the institution or through the student. And the first question about the application, uh, 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 I mean, the, the, the number of students that need to be funded by NESFAS. We don't have a limit. Uh, all you can be five at home. We, in fact, if we can find one, we will find all of them. Laduma of Amaklosa, he's a NESFAS funded student and all his, his siblings were funded by NESFAS. And he likes telling. So what we do, we say, we only fund for your one qualification your first qualification. But if you want to do your second qualification, we won't fund you. Or if you already have your first qualification, we won't fund you for your second qualification, even though your first qualification was not funded by NESFAS. Our objective is to make sure you have one qualification. Thanks. Okay, we've got a, another question just here. They said, um, I think it was Betty Dos Santos and another, uh, the same question was asked by Pumla. Uh, Kalimashi. She's saying that you mentioned that if you have paid your registration for a student, it gets refunded. Um, is this the case and how does it happen? Because Pumla is saying, I paid registration for my daughter and she was told the money can't be paid back um, and she can't claim it back. So obviously there's a lot of administrative type questions um, coming your way. My advice to Pumla is that get a statement from the university find out how much NESFAS is paying for that student. Two things are likely to happen. One, when a university claim money from NESFAS, they claim for everything. They claim for your books, they claim for your accommodation, they claim for your registration. So it's important that if you have already paid 5,000, the university can't claim that 5,000 you claim. If they've already claimed for it, it's due to you. Why will they keep it? They have to refund you. So if you can find the statement for me of the university, and then you find out from NESFAS call center how much the student has been paid. And if you feel that there's money, which is a balance, which is due to you, you contact the university, or if you are struggling, contact me, I'll facilitate that process. Does NESFAS fund postgraduate st studies? No, we don't fund postgraduate studies. However, we do fund additional studies which may be seen as postgraduate for the purpose of being registered and recognized as a professional. For example, 
if you do BA degree and then you add to do LLB, it, it's, it's a basic three year degree plus one year on honor so that LLB, then you are qualified as a lawyer. Do nursing. You may be required a diploma, you may be required to go to a certain level in order to be registered with the nursing council. Such a fun thing we will pay for. Okay, this is just a comment from Joseph Sakoneka. And he says, thank you, Mr. Mambabolo and your colleagues for helping to educate the nation. I'm hopeful for the future. I have used NASFAS since it was called TIFSA, TEFSA, and I am very grateful. So, you know, there's a lot of bad media about what you're doing, but you have shown, you know, there's some big numbers. Um, 70,000 to a youth is a lot of money. And definitely hand in hand with financial education, um, we will definitely get people who can stretch it further. So I think that is all the questions we have for now. Um, Joseph Sakoneka is also saying, what should students be reading to continue enhancing their knowledge on financial literacy to drive the right behavior and make the right decisions? Um, what are your recommended readings, et cetera? And I think, again, um, these are things which NASFAS is looking at as part of their funding to try and build in financial literacy. Is that something you're looking at doing so that at least when someone receives that money first time, they start getting prepared for their financial journey. Um, and for the other books which you want, I will put a, a, a few posts on the SASI Twitter um, timeline. You can read books from, from various financial experts. But in terms of NASFAS, are you going to marry the two in terms of financial education with um, the funding which you provide? Because it's a lot of money, 40, over 40 billion rand is no joke. Yes, no, thank you very much. My closing remarks would be, one, we, we have a new board, we, which started in January with a new CEO. They've done a tremendous work. One of the things they've done was to do a strategic plan for the next five years. Therefore, the, 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 one of their priorities is to ensure that we, pro, we provide a holistic support to students to succeed. That support means one, we need to make sure they have study material on time and that is adequate for their studies. Secondly, we need to give financial literacy in order for them to know how to spend. Third, we also need to revise policy. So what is looking at the missing middle, they're looking at the 350 of income, they're looking at the postgraduate funding, they look at, at uh, disability funding. So at the right time, the next fast and together with the minute announcement at, as to what are the huge policy changes for 2022 funding, but indeed, NESFAS is very interested in working with private sector in order to provide a comprehensive support for the students. Before I let you Thank go, Kakisho, Betty Dos Santos says, my question was not answered. Can people that are working, employed people, apply for NASFAS funding? Yes, if you are employed and you are earning less than 350,000 per annum, you are quali you you fall under the category of those who cannot afford to pay for their studies, including parents. Even if you're an old person, uh, but you've been admitted at the university, we don't discriminate against age. Anyone with an admission at university who ends below three fifty does qualify for NESFAS funding. Thank you. Thank you, Kakisho. We will let you go. There are so many, so much interest, and we thank NASFAS for joining us. We know you have a personal matter to attend to, so we will release you for this afternoon. If you have any further questions or thank comments, you, you can put them on the timeline. We will try and get Kakisho and his team to get back to us and basically... Thank you very much, uh, uh, Gerald, and thank you very much to the panelists and the, the listeners, and have a good afternoon. Thank you.
Hi everyone, we seem to have just lost Gerald temporarily. We will get him back because he is our next speaker, if you can bear with us. Thanks, I'm sure he's coming back in now. Well, we just give Gerald a few seconds to get back in. I'm gonna actually start my video here. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Excuse the, the toll here. Um, I'm just gonna, sorry, we always have these unexpected things happen. We, are, we have a number of other webinars coming up, which I'm sure you may be interested in as well. They're always gems of financial advice in everyone. The one that we have next week is going to be focused on stock files, something I think a lot of us have grown up with. And we have some very interesting speakers coming on to chat about stock files and how they are really evolving um, nowadays and the kinds of investments that stock files are achieving great results with and making a difference to their members and also their communities. Our next session will be focused on entrepreneurs. And last year, we had Hilary Mangwanya from Absa Bank come on, um, as well as other speakers focusing on entrepreneur financing, money matters for small businesses, how to really make the most of the cash and the capital that you have, um, how to get funding, how to best manage those money matters. And we've got Hilary again, which is great. So please do... If you've got an entrepreneurial mindset, if you're thinking of being an entrepreneur one day, if you are an entrepreneur, or if you know entrepreneurs, get them attending that webinar. It's going to really be excellent. We've also got renowned broadcaster Gugu Mfupi joining us. And she, while she's a broadcaster, she's also an entrepreneur. So she'll be sharing some of the information from her experiences as an entrepreneur and what her advice is, which I'm sure will be wonderful as she's interviewed so many financial people and business owners herself. So a wealth of knowledge there. And then I seem, we seem to have Gerald back, but I'm just gonna wrap up on the last webinar we have, which is focused on financial fitness for women. And with Women's Month coming up, this one's on the 28th of July. And that is also going to be full of great gems for the unique financial planning needs of women and mom entrepreneurs that are emerging now with the pandemic pressure. It's time to join up and find out how you can take control of your finances and all the things you need to be mindful of as a woman. So that's it from me. We've got Gerald back. Gerald, I'll hand back to you. Yes, after that technical break, um, let's close off. I think we were talking that most people are asking about financial education. So what I'm going to give is a basic financial education presentation for the youth to try and get someone who might be a student logged on right now on the right footing to start understanding a few of the basics around how money works and getting your financial education journey up and running. So we're going to go into the slideshow and we're talking, we're talking youth saving in your language, starting out strong. So as much as we've been using all the fancy financial terms like budgeting and all these things, if you've never encountered or been taught on basic financial literacy, it's all jargon, it's all words. It's another language. You might as well be speaking French because they are words which mean nothing to you. So these are some of the things we're going to cover quickly in the next 20 minutes, we're over time, and then obviously get you going. Now, this is, uh, these are some statistics from the old mutual savings and investment monitor from a, a year or two ago. They're not, they're not current, but I think they are still current in that a lot of people are living under financial stress. 
Now, a lot of students are also breadwinners. And I think this is the big challenge when you get NASA's funding and all your family also wants you to look after them. This is the so-called black tax. And you, it puts you in a situation where if you are a student, you're, you're suddenly stressed. Because at home, they also want food. At home, they also want you to help out. And it leads to a lot of people being under financial stress. In, in, at this point, it was 63% of South Africans saying they're under financial stress. But I would pretty much guarantee that when this same number comes out this year, I think in a week or two, um, it'll be more. And you are asking about how do I empower myself financially? One of the things is follow the, 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 these documents which come out. So there's this old mutual savings and investment model that's coming out next week. Look out for it, Google it. It's going to empower you financially. But the most important thing is let's start understanding how money works. Now, there are four financial pillars. Now, I'd like some interaction, if possible, um, in terms of what do you think the financial pillars are? If you can just quickly type it in on your comment section, what do you believe are the financial pillars? Now, I can't see the comments, so Tamron, if you can just send them to me on my cell phone, because obviously, um, as they come in, what do you believe are the financial pillars which will make you successful in terms of your financial journey? And, and we'll cover them, the four financial pillars which everyone should know about. Are there any comments coming through on the comment section? Nothing yet? Um, just that the black tax discussion needs to be discussed really. Um, and looking at very much live below your means. Okay. So you need to live before your, below your means. We've got black tax. Okay, let's go into the financial pillars. The first thing is you cannot be financially active without an income. Okay. Um, I think we've got a question on Facebook where the, a student is saying, I don't have an income. How can I save? The reality is if you don't have an income, you won't be able to save. So the first financial pillar, which, will, which you need to have is an income, okay? Now there are different ways of having more than one income. Your NASFAS funding is not necessarily deemed an income in terms of it's money which has to go to certain places, but you can have extra income on campus. I remember on campus, I used to cut hair, um, some of the girls would do other girls' hair, makeup. There's lots of things which you can do to get income because this is the key to you being financially active, income. Because a lot of students will finish varsity and they won't be able to even have an income. So I'll read some more of the ones that have come up, Gerald. So mm -hmm. it's income, expenses, debts were listed. Um, then financial pillars, income, savings, expenses, and investments, also assets. Someone has said entrepreneurship. Another person has said budgeting. This is awesome because these are some of the things we are talking about. The next financial pillar you have is when you have an income start saving. This thing of I can't save because I'm a student, it doesn't work. You can save 10 rand if NASFAS gives you 100 rand for a rainy day. Chris called it, you know, the fumble money. See, life happens. You don't have to eat every cent which comes in front of you. You, you know, when you get your NASFAS allowance, it's not a NASFAS target in terms of spend this money. It's an allowance to say, try and live within this means. So if you can get cheaper accommodation than your accommodation allowance, guess what? You are now able to participate in the second pillar of money, which is saving. That's how you save as a student live within the allowance means. Now, obviously, if you've got black tax, it's going to be a problem. But even black tax as a student, you can manage it. Do not tell your family exactly how much your allowance is. So if you know your NASFAS allowance is 3,000 Rand, tell your family you're getting 2,000 Rand because automatically it means that you're in a situation where there's a thousand Rand you can save and do other things. Control the conversation. One of the reasons many adults when end up in black tax after working is because you're fully disclosed. You showed off, you told them your income. So therefore they're also running mini budgets on your lifestyle. Now, saving is short term. Saving is the fumble money. It's the money about I need it in case something happens. Closely related to saving is investment. Investment is where you put in money 
which you want to vest. The vest means time. I'm putting in money for some time in vest. I'm putting in money for vesting, which is time. So if you're not put waiting for that time, it's not investment, it's saving. Because saving is the money I need next week. Anything can happen. I might need it to buy medication. I might need it for something else. But once you start talking investment, it means time. And perhaps for many students, it might be a, a premature discussion to start talking in vesting because you haven't finished your studies. So as a student, I'll probably say you're playing with your income and you're saving. But once you start talking investing, you're looking at minimum, I would say five years. <laughs> so money you say as a student, I'm investing, must be money you're saying I'm going to see when I've qualified, when I've graduated. Important as a student, your other important financial pillar is to give, 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 learn to give. The more you learn to give as a student to others who are less fortunate than you, then you will be set for life because it's just the financial principle that the, those who give the most receive the most. Even if you look at it from a SARS perspective, premise here, she's a CA, she'll tell you that if you donate, SARS can't help but give you more money back. It doesn't make sense, but that's the principle. You donate to give, you suddenly get deductions, money coming back to you. And this is important. Start understanding that principle as a student to give. Look after your fellow students and those who might be in a situation where the black tax is heavy. It's not as bad as your household. Black tax is heavy in different households. In some households, you're the first student who's gone to varsity. Everyone is depending on an SVAS income and you're trying to study. Help, the, help out if you can. So these are the positive pillars around your money. I'll go into the negative pillars now. Your financial enemies. These are the things which you need to fight from day one of your student life till the day you leave this earth. We already mentioned it, debt. Debt is not a friend. Already we've got statistics which show that you know, the debt to income ratio for South Africa is that the average South African is spending over three quarters of their salary paying back debt. And the problem with some of this debt is debt which came there was when they were students. They will come and they will give you a credit card on campus. A credit card is not evil, it's a financial tool. So if Chris comes with his team to your campus, welcome them. But if you get that credit card, understand how it works. Because if you do not understand how it works, it will put you into debt. And you're in debt when you're in a situation where you have liabilities and obligations, which Chris was talking about, your financial obligations, which you need to service. They mustn't be too much. Your other financial enemy is loss of income. COVID has caused drama to a lot of employed people. And a lot of students know what loss of income is when the money finishes. And then finished, finito, kaput. It's July and I've child my Nasrat money. What am I going to do? Control your income. Try not to lose your income. And how you try not to lose your income is by respecting your income. Respect the Nasfas money, respect Nasfas, because this money they're giving to you is for a real good cause. You know, a lot of the time money starts disappearing from your hands is if you do not respect money, I will tell you as a financial planning professional, those who don't respect money, it doesn't stay long with them. If you respect your rents from day one by budgeting and putting your money to good use, your money will be your friend all the days of your life. We've had those questions. How can I know more? I want to know more about these books. Where can I read more about financial education? And there's a lot of information out there. Don't be an ignoramus. There's a lot of good programs. And South African Savings Institute on our Ways to Save page, we've got links to a lot of our partners. The Financial Sector Conduct Authority, FSCA, has a great new program which teaches you um, about money and you can teach yourself along the way. Our other partners, Banking Association of South Africa, they have their own programs, the ASISA, the Association of Savings wow. and Investments of South Africa. They have programs. There's no shortage of information. But I guess my only warning for someone who loves to learn about money is try and limit your knowledge sources to credible sources. Um, Twitter, 
is a great source of information, but also a great source of misinformation. But don't be an ignoramus. Uncontrolled spending, the other enemy of your money. I'll try and get us all out by four o'clock. So I'm going to go through the next slides quickly. Don't spend too much. You heard NASFAS actually helps you budget by telling you this is accommodation allowance. This is grocery allowance. That's how budgeting works. Each one of those lines on your budget should say NASFAS gave me 4,000 grocery. NASFAS gave me 4,000 for books. These are just rough numbers. I don't know what the numbers would be. And then on the next column, you say, out of the 4,000 for groceries I got this month, I'm only spending 2,000. And that 2,000 you save, guess what? You put it into a savings pocket or you save it somewhere for a rainy day. That's how the journey starts around saving. There's no secret. You just have to start, preferably when you're a student. I remember when I was a student, when things were rough, I survived on cornflakes and baked beans and eggs. And I started enjoying them. You know, I, I then had recipes for eggs. Okay, I get curry and cumin and I make it uh, Indian style or I change the eggs. I make them Japanese style by ending soy, soy sauce. Eggs are very good. What did they do for me? They helped me save <laughs> because others were going and having burgers and quarters. I was surviving on eggs. Ultimately, you start saving. So make your choices. Remember your personal financial universe is about you. No one knows what goes in your stomach. As long as it's sustenance, it's okay. You don't have to be seen. You can even put your eggs in that chicken licking box and walk around and eat your eggs. No one will, no one will judge you. Finally, as a student, I'm going to ask you, are you avaricious? Now, you shouldn't be. Obviously, I can see the phones are going out, Google, avaricious. What does it mean? It's a clever word, yeah. You must go and tell the people who never attended this particular webinar. Ask them, are you avaricious? Because they don't know they were not here. I'll tell you the answer. People who are avaricious are greedy. They like things. What time is it? Are you avaricious? If you want to be a saver and an investor, you cannot be avaricious. You need to be someone who is kind to their money and kind with their money. Now, finally, I'm going to share this slide because as a student, you need to know what happens to money when people make it. Because it's all fair and square, you being taught about the basics. What's the final? What's the end goal? This is what wealthy people do with their money. 27% of wealthy people have a holiday home. This is from an old, old mutual savings monitor from a few years ago, but it's still nice to look at. 27% um, of wealthy people have a holiday home, which means that they, 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 they rest, their minds rest. They can't work forever, 24-7, 365. They go on holiday. Why? Because they budget for that holiday. Even more, 18% have a rental property. Why? They are creating income. Income is replacing yourself. So you can be sitting at home knowing money in Genile, not from Nasfas, but because you invested in a property. You put in money and you invest it. Okay? People with money consult advisors. I think a lot of people think that once you have lots of money, you know it all. 71% of wealthy people, they got a financial planning professional. So even you as a student, find yourself a financial planning professional um, to talk to. Most financial planning professionals will assist you and they will start helping you with your money. Try it. If you, if you have a problem, get a hold of me. I can help you as a student, get you with the right tools, the right budget spreadsheet, get you on that right journey because one day you will be there. So. If you have any issues, I'll share my details and you can get hold of me on Twitter and you can, you can, you can keep that conversation and we can actually empower each other. Okay, now wealthy people look after other people. Black tax is not just to you. It's not a curse, this black tax thing. Wealthy people look after orphans. You know, our Madonna and all these celebrities, they were children and people who they just adopt. Why? Because it's part of her being wealthy. That's the behavior. So when you make it, have a plan to look after someone else. Have a plan to send someone else to school. Have a plan to, to, to help someone else. 85% of, of, of wealthy people have multiple properties. So when they retire, they simply sell one house and then they can live off that. Retirement sounds like a long time away, but you as a student right now, a trick I can tell you right now, with your saving money, 
open a tax and savings account or a retirement annuity, take out a retirement annuity, you can. If you take out a retirement annuity at 20 or 19 and you pay just 200 rand a month, I'll do the numbers, you'll be scared. By the time you reach 40, 45, you're sitting on good, good money because of that thing we call compound interest. I'm not doing an interest, compound interest lesson today. We don't have time. Okay, and the last thing about um, wealthy people is, I want to share is about 28% of them are self-employed. Don't be afraid of ending up self-employed. A jobby job is someone telling you you are worth X amount, whether you like it or not. If you don't believe you're worth that amount, self-employment might be the way forward, <laughs> especially as South Africa is looking at a way of creating employment where we can basically be in a situation where, you know, we have entrepreneurs. Imagine being the boss at 22, 23. You can. But remember, self-employment doesn't mean tenders and big Mercedes. You can be self-employed and earn the same amount as someone who's fully employed. But the one thing you have control of is time. Because time is the ultimate currency. Money is not a currency of life. It's time. You want to buy time. When you go to work, you're selling your time. So those who are wealthy own their own time. They decide when they want to work. They decide when they want to go on holiday. Those who are selling their time don't have time. Start owning your time. And the last thing, I put this there deliberately, debt. Debt is not the enemy. It's being able to live within your means and pay for it. And if you have a financial contract, it's about being able to budget to keep up with that debt. Because if you can budget, if you can pay your debts nicely, you can build a credit profile. One of the questions we got, I think, from Joseph, he's saying that he attended last year's webinar about buying a car. He's improved his credit profile because he took the advice we gave. So, again, debt is not the enemy. Don't be fooled and told debt is the enemy. Never go into debt. You need it. Big companies need debt. People need debt to function. So understanding how you apply it in your situation, which is important. Okay, so focus on what you want, everyone. You are young, best time. Focus on what you want. Remember that with your finances, all you need is a plan. Clarify your intentions. Know what you want. Know what you want. Write it down. I'm 18 now. When I'm 25, I want this house. Be very specific. Because specific goals lead to specific outcomes. Okay? Just like, you know, there are those who are celebrating in Genile with no plan. You can have a plan as to the exact house you want, where you want it, and by when you want it. Once you have your goals on your budgets, on your plan, then you now work backwards. You always work backwards. I was reading um, something about Jeff Bezos, the uh, Amazon guy who just re retired, the founder, that he worked backwards with every plan he made. Any plan you work backwards. I want a house in wherever. Then you put attention. Okay, that house costs this amount. And then you work backwards. Don't be that person who says, I want to drive a GTI and you don't know the price of a GTI. Someone who is going to drive a GTI is someone who basically um, knows the price and knows how they're going to get it. They have a plan. You can be anything you want. You can do anything you want and you can have anything you choose. I think South Africa, we're a bit too negative, you know, and, and, and listening to, 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 to Nasfas and, and Kahisho, he showed us the good stuff that's happening. Fully paid for bursaries, no more Tesfas. It's not even a loan anymore. You should be celebrating that. You should not be celebrating that it's not enough. You should rather be saying, okay, how do I live within my means? Because you can't complain about money you wouldn't have had in the first place, but you have it. So let's start being a bit more positive in how we manage our money, how we manage our finances. And here at SASI, we've got partners, we've got friends who will help those who want to be empowered and those who want to to really start out strong in terms of their journey um, of financial education, of financial literacy, and those who really want to, you know, get onto that journey of money. Mula, it's a nice thing to have. Don't have enough, but I'm still working. And I'd like to thank everyone, I think, you know, who, who is here. And I'm going to do 
do my usual roll call where I start uh, recognizing attendees. We've got Dudu Mohobane, Agnes Kaz, Audrey, we see you, Matole, Avuye, Avuile, Katwebe, Betty Dos Santos, Poitumelo Pebane, Brian Saul, Desmond Chauke times two. You're locked on twice. Fikile, Underwater, Punzani, Chandukani, Google Etum Course. I'm mentioning your name so that when this recording is played and you play it again in 10 years' time, you know where we started this journey. Iman Kwepe, Nsiba, Irvin Bulalu. Isaac Totesi, Itumileng Moloi, Jabulile Makubo, Joey Lehomo, Joseph Sahonelka, Keleto Chabang, Kabira Pepeta, Lerato Mokoka, Lindy Makamo, Luisa Nshabele, Lungile Nkize, Maholo, Mamolo, Mahloko Elizabeth. Let's all, let's all know. Maritza Potita, um, Marcel Lepe Mpo Matlala. I'm reading this role call so that we know we were all here when we started the money journey. Mfu many L's, Natasha Kalipa, Nkate Kumkasi, Nomfunde Tlongwani, Onye Kachi, Okoli, Ochepe Makaudi, Poli Matseke, Pumla Mabundla, Pum Punza Mali times two, Retsibe Map. Patlele, Samuel Motebani, Si Patisi Le Nube, Si Tembi Le Shabangu, Tanaka Sangweme, Tebo Chabedi, Tab Tabeta, Tabeta, Kekana, Tam Taming Tamitele, no, he's old, <laughs> but we know him. Um Tatomo, Tam Tato Mota, Titi, Gore Gorem Sandu, Victoria. Mamera Gani and Vuyole to Samata Viningara, Yolanda Rod, Zah, Zahelem Plomo, Zama Sikaka, Sikakane, and Zama Tungwa. Thank you. It's been a journey, it's been real. It's, talk, it's good to talk about youth finances. I'd like to thank our speakers, um, Chris Philip from APSA, our partners, always good to us, APSA, good bank. Remember, when you're looking for a financial institution, still shop around, but our friends are absolutely we like them. They're good people. I'd like to thank um, Kakiso Mamabolo from NASPAS, our new partners as well. We're going to be going into that consumer education space. And obviously we will also be sharing our nuggets and information to you. Stay tuned, we're now announcing our winner. Yes, I told you there was money coming through. It's nice to work with the bank. Thanks. Sometimes they, 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 they do good things like give us money. And these, these random prizes are chosen on interaction. These are people who have been posting um, a lot of comments, a lot of engagement. Zama, Sikakane, and Tato Mota, a thousand rand is coming to you. And a thousand rand invested now, you can do a lot with it. You can save it, you can do anything with it, but this is just for sharing the last two hours of your afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining us. We've got the other webinars coming through. Next week, we've got stock fails. As students, start your stock fail. We've now know the, the pillars of money. If we start our stock fail now, we ingenile. Ingenile, when you know where it's coming from, not ingenile, just don't check, you know? So thank you everyone for joining us, Tamron, always supporting us in the back end. And yes, um, even though the, the internet strives to steal our joy, we still won and reconnected. So I'd like to thank everyone. I enjoy this guys, I can talk forever. But if you want to follow me, it's Ask Gerald CFP. Ask Gerald CFP on Twitter or askgerald.co.za. Askgerald.co.za. Our website, our ways to save.co.za. Ways to save.co.za. That's our SASI website. Or if you want the mother website for SASI, it's savingsinstitute.co.za. And I can see our chairperson has also been sitting through this afternoon. Prem, we always thank you for your love, for your support. Prem Governor, you will see her on the last webinar. Um, on on womanra, on the power of women in terms of finances and driving money. And our other webinar is on the 21st, which is, so Prem is on the 28th, 
the 21st, we've got a great webinar coming through on small business. That one should be pretty interesting as well. Start thinking outside the box. No one, no one said you must be an employee. Employ yourself because if you are an employer, you can be that person who's then known as a legator. <laughs> I'm using a financial planning term, I like that. A legator is someone who leaves a legacy to his legatees. Okay, what's that? Financial planning 101, you can study financial planning. Legator is someone who can leave an inheritance. Your inheritance is your legacy. The legatees are those who are receiving it. You want them to put your picture up in a house somewhere to thank you for having lived. And you want your children to wake up and understand what a usufruct is. I love the word usufruct because some people are born into things they never bought. A usufruct is the use of an asset you never actually purchased. Start thinking big. Think big while you're young. Thank you very much from Sassy. And it's been great. Um, we'll catch up soon. And well done to Tato and Zama for winning the thousand rand prizes. Tamsang Atele, the person who sponsored the prizes at APSA. Thank you very much. Pumla, I also saw you on there. Thank you very much. And it's a great afternoon. The recording will be available. Please get your friends to watch it. And the slides will be available as well. Thank you very much. Okay, let's play out with the song, I guess. And then let's find a song to play. And then everybody can watch the video as we say bye-bye and, you know, enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you.